Hello, I'm Alma Angeles and you're watching Eagle News International. Good evening, CJ. Good evening, Alma, and good evening to everyone joining the broadcast. Here are the headlines. Climate change and the relaunch of uh, the global economy will top the G20 agenda as leaders of the world's most advanced nations meet today the first in-person gathering since the pandemic. Hail hits a swimming pool and pelts cars in the South Australian city of Adelaide. Severe weather warnings have been issued by the state's Bureau of Meteorology. No matter how much of and real guns can safely be used on movie sets so long as protocols are followed. According to U.S. actor Matthew McConaughey in a Zoom interview with AFP, calls mount to ban firearms from filmmaking in the wake of the Rust shooting. First in our news, climate change and the relaunch of the global economy will top the G20 agenda as leaders of the world's most advanced nations meet on Saturday or today, the first in-person gathering since the pandemic. Looming over the two-day talks in Rome, looming over the two-day talks in Rome is pressure to make headway on tackling global warming ahead of the key COP26 summit kicking off in Glasgow Monday. The stakes are high with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warning G20 leaders Friday to show more ambition and more action and overcome mistrust in order to advance climate goals. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi met leaders as they arrived in the futuristic convention center known as the Nuvola or Cloud in EUR, a southern Rome district built by Benito Mussolini to glorify his fascist regime. U.S. President Joe, Bly or Joe Biden flew in on Friday hoping to turn a page from the tumultuous Trump years and show that American leadership on the world stage is restored. Yet the Democrat faces a credibility test as his own signature climate policy, part of a sweeping economic package, is held up amid infighting within his own party in Congress. Russia's Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping are absent from Rome, attending only by video link, but the others are taking advantage of the first in-person G20 for more than two years to hold a flurry of bilaterals. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the host of the UN Climate Summit next week, said neither the G20 nor the COP26 meeting could stop global warming. And the most, he said, we can hope to do is to slow the increase. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Friday urged China's President Xi Jinping and other world leaders to take concrete action on climate change as they spoke by phone ahead of the upcoming COP26 talks. The pair discussed a range of issues, including action to address the climate crisis ahead of COP26, global trade and economic cooperation, and security and human rights, according to a press release from Johnson's Downing Street office. Johnson's government is hosting the two-week UN summit in Glasgow from Sunday, but she will not be attending. China did, however, on Thursday renew its emissions cutting plan with a promise that its carbon pollution would peak before 2030. Many had hoped for China to wean itself off coal and peak em emissions much earlier than 2030 and reduce pollution from heavy industries such as cement, steel and aluminum over the next five years. Meanwhile, protesters turned out around the world today ahead of the UN Climate Summit that starts on Sunday in Glasgow, Scotland. In London, activists rallied in the financial district to protest fossil fuel investment. Demonstrators also gathered in New York, Tel Aviv, Paris, and other cities. Take a look. Followed the money to get here. Now let's tell the Fed what they need to follow. Yes. Let's yeah. tell them to follow the science, follow their conscience, and follow the people. 
I came here because time is running out and I want to have a future and I want my families and my friends to be able to live on this planet and breathe the air and drink the water and not have to worry about a house on fire. And I think that it's time for our leaders to prioritize this issue because if we don't take it seriously then we're not going to have a planet at all and we have no planet B. This is the only earth that we've ever known, it's the only home we've ever had. Protesters with the organization AVAS, a U.S.-based nonprofit, also held a demonstration in front of the Colosseum ahead of the G20 in Rome to demand the distribution of funds by G20 member states to combat climate change. The performance included an ABBA cover band playing a satirical version of Money, Money, Money. Hail hits a swimming pool and pelts cars in the South Australian city of Adelaide. Now, with severe weather warnings have been issued by the state's Bureau of Meteorology. A destructive storm brought down power lines and tore roofs off houses overnight in Victoria, Australia. More than 300,000 Victorians are still without power and some residents may in the dark or may be in the dark until Monday. Energy Minister Lily D'Ambrosio said nearly a quarter of the whole state had lost power as of this morning with 526,000 properties hit by black blackouts. Now, according to The Guardian News, Victoria State Emergency Service received more than 950 calls for help in the last 24 hours to 7.30 a.m. on Friday. The most affected areas include the Ballarat, Bendigo, and Melbourne's eastern suburbs. There were 743 reports of trees down and 149 reports of building damage, and those numbers were expected to rise as Victorians report more damage. More than 4,000 lightning strikes were detected within a 400-kilometer radius of Maryborough, about 168 kilometers northwest of Melbourne. The the Bureau also reported more than 500,000 lightning strikes had hit Southeast Australia in the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, flooding from heavy rain hit parts of the U.S. East Coast on Friday U.S. time, particularly aired the area around Washington with potential for some of the worst damage in decades. Now, the area stretching from the U.S. capital north to Baltimore is facing the biggest tidal flood events of the past 10 to 20 years, according to the National Weather Service. It's said that in some areas, the damage could be the worst since that caused by the Hurricane Isabel in 2003. Coastal flooding alerts have been issued from the state of Virginia all the way north to New Jersey. In the Maryland state capital, Annapolis, located an hour's drive from Washington, on the Chesapeake Bay, the water came up to people's knees. At least one man used a kayak to navigate the inundated streets. On Monday, California was hit by torrential rains that caused several floods after months of drought and repeated forest fires. Climate change is regularly blamed for causing extreme weather events. Thousands of New York police officers and firefighters and others refuse to comply with a city deadline to get vaccinated. They will be put on unpaid leave starting on Monday. Democratic Mayor Bill de Blasio announced last week that all public employees, including police officers and firefighters, will have to get vaccinated by November 1st or they will be placed on unpaid leave until they can provide proof of a shot. They will not have the option of providing a negative test instead, but medical and religious exemptions will be allowed. South Africa has approved the clinical trial for a COVID vaccine pill, according to Israeli pharmaceutical company Oramed. Now, its majority-owned subsidiary, Oravax Medical, has received clearance to begin enrolling patients in the trial of an oral vaccine, according to the company in a statement. South Africa has hosted several COVID vaccine trials. This will be the first for an oral approach. The company said oral vaccines are particularly attractive 
attractive for the developing world because they reduce the logistical burden of immunization campaigns. The World Health Organization also on Thursday warned that Africa's vaccination efforts risked being paralyzed by a severe shortage of syringes needed to administer jabs. Effective vaccines without a needle since the start of the COVID pandemic. Researchers have doubled down on efforts to create patches that deliver life-saving drugs painlessly to, to the skin, a development that could revolutionize medicine. Now, the, the uh, Australian U.S. team used patches measuring one square centimeter that were dotted with more than 5,000 microscopic spikes, so tiny you cannot actually see them, according to David Mueller, a virologist at the University of Queensland and co-author of the paper. A new mouse study in the area published in the journal Science Advances showed promising results. The immune systems of those who got the patch produced high levels of neutralizing antibodies after due doses, including in their lungs, vital to stopping COVID and the patches outperformed syringes. The technique could help save children's tears at doctor's offices and help people who have a phobia of syringes. Beyond that, skin patches could assist with distribution efforts because they don't have cold chain requirements and might even heighten vaccine efficacy. The Food and Drug Administration formally recommended Pfizer's COVID vaccine for young children. The CDC will make the final decision next week on the lower dose shots for 5 to 11 year olds. The vaccine safety was also studied in more than 3,000 children and no serious side effects have been detected in the ongoing study. In this age group, the vaccine is given as two shots three weeks apart, dosed at 10 micrograms, a third of what is given to older age groups. Severe COVID is rarer in children than adults, but but far from non-existent. According to the CDC, there have been 8,300 COVID hospitalizations of children aged 5 to 11 since the start of the pandemic and 146 deaths. Hospitals around Papua New Guinea are overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients, but authorities there say they prefer fast vaccination rollout than a hard lockdown. We have Echo Hortaleza Quinola of our EBC uh, headquarters there at Papua New Guinea with a story. In a press conference held in Taurama Aquatic Center, which is also one of the quarantine facilities in Port Moresby, National Capital District Governor Honorable Poe Sparkop, along with the senior officials in medical field, spoke to the media about the present situation of the city. The Port Moresby General Hospital and the St. John's Ambulance are both suffering a crisis point that will break down any time unless they receive support in terms of resources, manpower, medical workers and staff, medical supplies, hospital equipment, oxygen and modern facilities. I want to thank each and every one of them and their family from the bottom of my heart for their, all that they are doing to support our people and keep us healthy and importantly overcome this challenge. But the sad reality now is that the health system and all the effort is tittering on collapse. You all have heard it already. They are pressed by manpower, not enough manpower. They are pressed by bed space, all the isolation wards, all the different wards in the Portmore General Hospital, Hospital are already overwhelmed. Port Moresby General Hospital CEO Dr. Paki Molomi reported the alarming large number of deaths which occurred in just a week. Governor Poe Sparkop will not impose lockdown as of this report, though social, public and big crowd gatherings are still banned. It's a serious discussion now, but we have not made addition yet. I have to, I'm waiting for the Secretary for Health. I've spoken to some doctors already, our three CEOs, 
from the hospital and uh, trauma aquatic center and PHA, they still have not given me the waves. If they all say we do it, then we might we might have to do it. But um, I hope we don't have to do it because it doesn't work in the past. It doesn't really break break in the transmission. So if you're going to do a lockdown, it, it has to be very precise. He also pleaded to the public to be vaccinated in order to break the circle of transmission of COVID-19 and Delta variant. It's about be, being responsible and doing the right thing. And the right thing is to get our people to adhere to the protocols. But more importantly, to take the vaccine. The government is advising the people to also stop believing in all misinformation, pseudo-intellectuals, false beliefs, and misconceptions concerning the vaccination. The governor furthermore educates the people that survival will improve if you are vaccinated and caught COVID-19. It will also reduce the need to be hospitalized. At this moment, the entire isolation ward in Port Moresby General Hospital is already in full capacity. Among the other attendees during the press conference were Executive Officer Dr. Albert Newton, City Manager Stephen Yanni, and St. John Ambulance CEO Matt Cannon. The government can only do as much. It's all up to the constituents to do their part. Vaccination centers are everywhere in NCD. COVID-19 is real and it kills. Everyone is encouraged to make a wise decision. Reporting from Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, this is Echo Hortaleza Quinola, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Thank you, Echo. Tongans are flocking to vaccination centers today after the government warned the main island of uh, Tonga Tapu might be plunged into lockdown next week after recording its first case of the coronavirus. The infected person was among 215 people on a repatriation flight from the New Zealand city of Christchurch. A routine test on arrival Thursday while in compulsory managed isolation returned a positive result the following day. Prime Minister Pohiva Tuenetoa warned islanders on Saturday to prepare for the possibility of a lockdown if more cases emerge. But he said there was no need for immediate action as it could take more than three days before a person with a virus becomes contagious. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Let's go! Samut saring mga video sang ating nakikita Iba't ibang eksena lalo na sa social media May nakakalokang video, may nakakatawang video May nakakamanghang video sa Fires na kapal video May nakakaaliw na video, may pangasar na video May trending at viral video sa Fires na kapal video Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, ang dyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back to the news. The price of petrol in Britain hit a record high. Oil prices pressed higher on world markets with a male international contract Brent at a three-year high above $86 per barrel. Here's Patricia Rodriguez. 
people in Britain hit a record high of 149.94 pence per liter, the RAC Modern Organization said on Monday. The previous record at the pump set in April 2012 was broken on Sunday as global oil prices rise dramatically. It doubled from around $40 a barrel a year ago to $85 now. The price of diesel fuel in Britain at 146.5 pence a liter is also nearing its 2012 record. Factors beyond the oil price hike have fed into the price rise at the pumps. September's switch to greener E10 petrol also played a part, as has the margin retailers are taking on every liter sold, which is now greater than it was prior to the start of the pandemic. On September 1, the bio content of unleaded petrol increased from 5% ethanol to 10%, and as ethanol is more expensive than petrol, it added around a penny a liter to the cost to motorists. The biggest element of the price paid by British consumers is tax. Duty at 57.95 pence a liter exceeds the combined bio and petrol components, which amount to around 50% leading to calls from the RAC and others for the government to drop the bat on petrol to tame the price. The latest gains for crude oil come after Saudi Arabia said OPEC and other major producers would be cautious in lifting output despite surging demand, warning that the pandemic still posed a threat to the outlook. Petrol prices at the pump have also broken records in France and Germany. Reporting from London, United Kingdom, I'm Patricia Rodriguez. We live in interesting times. Staying in the United Kingdom, UK gross domestic product output is expected to rebound by 6.5% this year before slightly slowing next year. Here's JL Bautista from our EBC UK Bureau. UK gross domestic product output is expected to rebound by 6.5% this year before slowing slightly in 2022, said Sunak. The 2021 forecast was much stronger than the 4.0% GDP growth predicted in March, but Sunak added that the pace of output would slow to 6.0% next year. He said the UK economy was on course to return to its pre-pandemic level at the turn of the year, while recognizing that people are concerned about global inflation as economies reopen after lockdowns. Sunak said the UK annual inflation rate was forecast to climb to an average of 4.0% over the next year from 3.1% currently, with price rises fueled by soaring in energy costs and post-Brexit supply constraints. Britain's growth expectation this year, meanwhile, compares favourably with Europe's biggest economy, Germany, which Wednesday forecast GDP expansion of around 2.6% in 2021. On the eve of its budget, the UK government revealed plans to raise minimum wage rates and end a freeze on pay prices for public sector workers. But the boost to salaries is likely to be offset by rising inflation, which is denting Britain's spending power. A further hit has come from the government returning welfare benefit payments to pre-pandemic levels after a temporary hike to help families through the virus outbreak. British unemployment, meanwhile, risks soaring in the coming months after the government ended its costly jobs furlough scheme, which paid the bulk of wages for millions of private sector workers during the pandemic. Government borrowing rocketed to around £320 billion in the financial year to March, driven higher by costly COVID support. That was equivalent to 14.9% of gross domestic product, the highest UK level since the end of World War II. From London, United Kingdom, this is J.L. Bautista. We live in interesting times. A marriage that broke a royal family. Princess Mako, the eldest daughter of Crown Prince Nahorito, chose love over the crown. She married her college sweetheart, a commoner named Kei Kamuro. The couple was first engaged in 2017, but the wedding was delayed following a financial scandal involving the groom's mother, leaving the public to question whether he was marrying her for love or for money. We have Dennis Liu telling us more. Japan's Princess Mako married her university sweetheart on Tuesday, but it was a low-key union bereft of traditional rituals, with the couple voicing sadness over the controversy that haunted their engagement. Under the rules of the imperial family, Emperor Naruhito's 30-year-old niece, Mako, gave up her royal title 
uh, Shiwed K. Komuro, who is the same age and works for a U.S. law firm. <laughs> After the marriage was registered, she told reporters that for her, K is irreplaceable. For since announcing their engagement in 2017, the couple has faced tabloid scandals and vicious online sniping over allegations that Komuro's family had run into financial difficulties. After much delay, they finally tied the knot with no wedding ceremony, reception banquet, or any of the usual rites, opting to do so privately away from a public that has not always been kind. あ、絶対反対ですね。それは絶対反対です。うん。やっぱりまこ様には<笑> なんかこの日が迎えることができて、うん、良かったなって思いますね。もっと祝福できるような形の方が本来は良かったのに、なんとなく雰囲気がね、なんかきついような状態になったのがやっぱりちょっと寂しいというか残念やったかなという感じは正
matter how much of a rush you're in, no matter if you're chasing the sunlight, sun. When it comes to firearms, you don't you, you don't you don't want to cut corners and go, oh well, let's just check. No, it's not the time to wing it. It's not the time to go. Well, maybe we can just get one more. No, there, there's a safety protocol, and if it's followed, it's it's it can be safe on set. There is a understood protocol when any firearm is handed from one person to another, when it gets on set. There is a means of communication. One of the beautiful things about how film sets work, the organization is incredible. And they miss protocol. Somewhere, I don't know if they were, I don't know if they were in a rush. I don't know exactly what happened. I don't, they're still being investigated. I, I'm, I'm not sure. And I would, I would, I personally would try to always take even more steps of you hear cold. Now I want a visual. And if you and I are in the scene together, I need to give you visual. If it's a six shooter, do you see light through all six holes? Let me look you in the eye. You confirm, and you yell it out. Cold. Then I come to you, Nicholas. Cold. And you just get this. You can't over confirm it. Now, Alec Baldwin fired the uh, Colt 45 during a rehearsal after being told it was safe. With the man who handed him the gun later admitting to police he had not fully checked it for live rounds. Baldwin had been told by assistant director Dave Halls that it was a cold gun industry lingo for an inert firearm. While not criticizing Baldwin, McConaughey said he personally would try to always take even more steps as an actor using a gun, including checking the weapon himself. Meanwhile, the rust armorer, 24-year-old Hannah Gutierrez Reed, responsible for weapons on the film set on Friday, uh, said on Friday that she has no idea why there were live rounds present. Her comments come after days of reports of safety lapses on the set, including claims that the crew members had used prop weapons for live ammunition target practice on the day of the tragedy, a notion Gutierrez Reed dismissed on Friday. Prosecutors have refused to rule out charges, including against Baldwin, who was a producer on Rust, as well as the lead actor. Take a look. Well, obviously, uh, I think the industry has, has had a record recently of being safe. I think there was some complacency on this set, and uh, I think there are some safety issues that need to be addressed by the industry and possibly by the state of New Mexico, but I'll leave that up to, uh, to the industry and the state to determine what those need to be. All options are on the table at this point. I'm not, take, I'm not commenting on charges, whether they will be filed or not, or on whom. So the answer is we, we cannot answer that question yet until we complete a more thorough but investigation. But there is the potential for Alec Baldwin himself to face charges because you have not ruled them out. No one has been ruled out at this point. In New Jersey, the Union County collects more than 500 unwanted guns in a buyback amnesty event. Ella Gilar for the details. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Prosecutor, uh, for such a successful uh, buyback program. I believe it was the most successful program in the state of New Jersey. Over 500 weapons and firearms have been collected by the authorities in Union County in just one day through its annual Guns for Cash or Gun Amnesty Buyback Program here in New Jersey. Commissioner, uh, everyone up here pulled off a tremendously successful gun buyback program here in Union County this past Saturday. Uh, the results were beyond our wildest expectations, and we're very, very happy. And there's a lot of people up here, but there are another 50 who are part of this team who are on the ground doing all the work. The gun buyback program is a collaboration between the state, county, and local organizations calling on residents to turn in weapons in their possession, weapons that they don't need regardless of its condition. According to Prosecutor William Daniel, the goal is to keep communities safe. The program also aims to prevent unwanted weapons to fall into the hands of wrong people, which may result in the loss of lives. For those who will come forward and participate in this Guns for Cash program, officials made sure that their identities will remain anonymous and there will be no questions asked. 
As a result of this one-day program, over 500 weapons, including assault weapons, rifles, sh- Each surrendered, surrendered firearm displayed on the table here in front of us represents a potential tragedy avoided. Surrendering these guns has prevented them from potentially contributing to a suicide, a fatal shooting, an accidental discharge by a child or unsuspecting family member, or their use in the commission of a crime. Removing these unwanted firearms from our communities has helped prevent these types of tragic events from happening. For those who will come forward and participate in this Guns for Cash program, officials made sure that their identities will remain anonymous and there will be no questions asked. As a result of this one-day program, over 500 weapons, including assault weapons, rifles, shotguns, BB pellet guns, and even the deadly weapons have been surrendered to the authorities. Now, today I'm pleased to announce that Saturday's gun buyback events in the cities of Elizabeth, Westfield, and Plainfield, right here in Union County, resulted in the surrender of more than 520 firearms, uh, some of which are stolen or suspected to be stolen some of which, at least six of which, are categorized as assault firearms. Uh, there, you can see, there are many, many, many rifles here, shotguns, pistols of all shapes and sizes, uh, you name it, it's here. It came from every area of this county and from beyond, whether it be from down to Fort Elizabeth, West End, and uh, Plainfield, uh, Summit, Westfield, these guns, they came from every corner of the county. Uh, and uh, beyond, people drove in from counties around the state. There were some of the things that were turned in, you don't see here. People came in with bags of ammunition. Each surrendered weapon has an equivalent value ranging from $25 to $250 per gun or firearm. Union County released over $90,000 in exchange for weapons. The funds came from what they call full feature funds. This is the money seized or taken away by the police from arrested individuals found to be involved in illegal or criminal activity. According to Commissioner Alexander Mirabella, even though New Jersey is one of the states with stricter gun ownership laws in the nation, it is not unusual for people to come and turn in their unlicensed or unwanted gun. This could be a result of an inheritance, a gift, or a hobby. Every individual had their own personal reason for wanting to get rid of their firearms and the ammunition, but the commonality among all is that they chose to responsibly surrender these weapons and ammunition, ensuring that they would be disposed of properly. We hope this event raises the awareness against, you know, about the importance of getting unwanted guns off the streets in our neighborhoods for this gun amnesty buyback program is effective and said to be the safest way for the owners to dispose their unwanted weapons. From Union Township, El Aguilar, for Eagle News, we live in interesting times. From the U.S., we go to Canada, where the Iglesia Ni Cristo, Church of Christ, hosted an INC Giving Blood donation drive. Here's Melanie Ronquillo from our EBC Ottawa Bureau. Here in Ottawa, life is starting to have a semblance of pre-pandemic days. People are out and about. There are fewer restrictions on travels and gatherings. Even hospitals are now doing the surgical procedures the COVID-19 put on hold. With the increase of procedures and operations in medical facilities, comes the increase in the demand of blood and blood donors. According to the Canadian Blood Services, while all blood types help patients, there is a specific need for donors with the universal blood type O negative. To help fill the demand for blood to be used in medical procedures, the members of the Church of Christ or Iglesia Ni Cristo in Ottawa conducted the INC Giving Blood Donation Drive. Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson commends volunteers for their efforts and community engagement in the city. 
Hi, I'm Jim Watson, Mayor of the City of Ottawa, and I'm very pleased to recognize all of the members and volunteers at the Church of Christ in Ottawa for your continued dedication and contributions in support of your community. As part of your ink giving projects and through your shared faith and compassion, all of you have done so much to give back to your community in meaningful ways, including a cleanup drive, a blood donor drive, and collecting care packages for those in need. You should all be very, very proud of your commitment to your community and to one another. Keep up the great work and God bless. Thank you. Merci. It is very important to help our fellow men and in this instance, well, blood is needed all the time. There's a constant need for it. There are people who need medical assistance and this is our way in helping the people in this part of the world. Today, we're conducting IAC Giving Blood Donation to the Canadian Blood Services in Ottawa as they are in need of blood donors. The bread is in our prepare for the event and we have at least 16 blood donors who gladly donated blood. Volunteerism, like what was shown in this event, is truly a way for communities to successfully reopen and rebuild. In Ottawa, Canada, this is Melanie Ronquillo. We live in interesting times. Eagle News will be back with more stories. Please don't go away. Let's go! Samut saring mga video sang ating nakikita Ibat ibang eksena lalo na sa social media May nakakalokang video, may nakakatawang video May nakakamanghang video, sa fanis na kapal video May nakakaaliw na video, may pangasar na video May trending at viral video, sa fanis na kapal video Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Jimmy Butler scored 32 points and grabbed 10 rebounds, while Bam Adebayo had 26 points as the Miami Heat stretched their winning streak to three straight games with a 114-99 win over Charlotte Hornets on Friday. Now Adebayo added 19 rebounds and Tyler Harrow came off the bench to score 26 for the Heat in the battle between the NBA's top defensive team against the top offensive club. The Hornets came into the game averaging 121 points per game. Gordon Hayward scored a team high of 23 points and Miles Bridges scored 22 for the Hornets in front of a crowd of 19,600 at FTX Arena in Miami. The Hornets were missing Terry Rozier, who was out with an injured ankle. The Hornets' Lamelo Ball struggled as the reigning NBA Rookie of the Year finished with just six points on two of 14 shooting. Elsewhere, LeBron James returned from a two-game injury absence to score 26 points and dish out eight assists as the Los Angeles Lakers beat his old team, the Cleveland Cavaliers 113-101. James missed two games with a sore right ankle. Carmelo Anthony scored 24 points and Russell Westbrook finished with 19 points for the Lakers, who halted the Cavaliers' three-game winning streak. The Lakers, who won for the third time in four games, took control down the stretch with Anthony hitting three 
three pointers in front of a crowd of 19,100 at Stables Center. Rookie Evan Mobley led the Cavaliers with 23 points. And here we go. Here's MJ Rocario in his exclusive interview with Filipina Canadian actress Xenia Marshall, where they talk about her new TV series, One of Us is Lying. MJ. Hi, MJ Rocario here. Here's a showbiz update. Phil Canadian actress Xenia Marshall snagged a recurring role in the Hollywood's new hit series, One of Us is Lying. I had an exclusive interview with her. Take a look. Tell us about the new series that you worked on. I know it's going to come out very soon. Um, you're playing a, uh, I should say, like a singer student uh, with that new. Can you talk about it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I can understand why you think that she's a singer because they're in the in the trailer. She's in front of a microphone, but she's actually not a singer in the show. Um, but she is um, basically. Uh, Cooper is one of like the leads and he's this pro uh, baseball player and I'm essentially his girlfriend throughout the show and a friend for him throughout the show and it's all she's also like my first half Filipino half white character like Filipino character I've ever auditioned for and have ever seen it's um, amazing an audition before and she was originally written that way in the book to be half Filipino half white and I'm half Filipino half white and I was like reading it and I'm like this is like my first time ever seeing this not like for starters in a book and then in a like in casting like in a show Hollywood spectrum I'm just like I was so happy to see that and I was just like it didn't I, I wasn't I don't think I was conscious of that that I hadn't seen that before until when I saw it and then I was like wow I can't believe I've never seen this before so I was really excited to get her in because I was like wow this is the the first time that this is happening and I'm I'm more than um grateful to be able to play this role come over and watch one of us is lying it's going to be on Peacock, which is a new streaming service, and it's um, collaboration between NBC and Universal. Until next time, always tune in to Eagle News. This is MJ Ricardio. We live in interesting times. The Umbrella Studio of Contemporary Arts is home to many bright and inspiring artists. From 10th of September, the organization presents four new exhibitions by renowned artists there. Here is Morgan Goodfellow for the report. Morgan. The Umbrella Studio here in Townsville, Queensland has introduced four new exhibitions that are sure to wow artists and art enthusiasts alike. Located at 408 Flinders Street, Townsville, the Umbrella Studio of Contemporary Arts is home to many bright and inspiring artists. From the 10th of September 2021, the organisation presents four new exhibitions by renowned artists Gail Marbo, Alexandra Costic D, P. Cairns, and the North Queensland Conservation Council. Gail Marbo's House of Cards is both a metaphorical and physical interpretation of her relationships with her family, representing chapters of her childhood as well as her mothers and fathers. Alexandra Costic D's I Am Here depicts the contrast between nature and the female body, looking closely at the beauty of maternity and rebirth against the negativity that is so prevalent in society today. Pecan's Postcards from North and South is a collaborative effort of printmakers from New Zealand, showcasing the creativity and process behind their seventh postcard print exchange. Finally, the North Queensland Conservation Council's Nature, the Wonder and the Tragedy features small works donated by artists from North Queensland and beyond, bringing together art and conservation. Each work that will be auctioned off to raise important funds goes towards supporting the North Queensland Conservation Council. It's quite fabulous, I think, that the, um, the exhibit at the moment has that focus on our natural environment and particularly uh, the importance of conservation um, of the beautiful environment. Queensland and most of the works are done by local artists and 
there's also that really important sort of cultural and Indigenous perspectives um, as well. So all in all, I just thought it was fabulous. These magnificent displays are free for the public to view, all the while observing the necessary health protocols. If you happen to be in the area, be sure to take the time to enjoy these exhibits while you can. Reporting from Townsville, Australia, this is Morgan Goodfellow, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Thank you, Morgan. Now, Tiffany Alisasis takes us beyond Van Gogh when uh, the Travelling Art Exhibition made its stop in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Tiffany Alisasis, please. We are here at the BMO Centre located in Calgary, Alberta. We are about to immerse ourselves into Vincent Van Gogh's artwork. So let's go check it out. Beyond Van Gogh breaks the confines of the frame and allows the spectator to be fully immersed in a world larger than life where one can virtually feel the paint being applied to the digital canvas. This exhibition also embraces the freedom of exploring many different themes of his artwork. So let's get to know a little bit about Van Gogh. Van Gogh was a painter that uh, lived uh, in the late 19th century. Um, he's, he had a short, short production. Uh, he, had a, he was a torn painter. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, unfortunately uh, passed away with very young, uh, but that had uh, the ability and the capacity to produce uh, a lot of good paintings in the short term that he did. This exhibit uses about 45 projectors that play the content all over the walls and the floors of the hall. Stunning masterpieces such as the Starry Night, Sunflowers, and Cafe Terrace at Night can be seen at this exhibit. To expect to be uh, to really dive into the paintings, uh, the experience is is, uh, is basically uh, it's uh, uh, you know we're using projection mapping to there's the different arrays of projectors on floors, mm -hmm. uh, walls, and also uh, monoliths which are like uh, structures, mm -hmm. and then uh, the idea is to create this universe to which like you don't know where it begins and it end, it ends. Mm -hmm. um, it's good for families for kids. You could not be um, uh, worried that you know it's a uh, like painting event and you need to know I think uh, the, the, the way that the, the experience is designed is you first go into an education room where you you read and you get to learn about Van Gogh mm -hmm. and then there's the uh, waterfall to which is the, your first encounter with projection yeah. so it's like a, a transition area that then leads you to the main exhibit cinematic Van Gogh exhibitions have crossed the oceans from European cities to North America in the recent years. In a distinctive and unique multimedia artistic adventure, using cutting-edge multi-dimensional projection technology, developed by some of the world's greatest audio-visual designers and technicians. Beyond Van Gogh encompasses the same iconic flair Van Gogh's vast body of work with a very new twist unlike anything art lovers have seen before. Using the artist's own dreams, thoughts, and words to drive an unmatched narrative experience. Van Gogh's exquisite work projected on walls invite guests to fully immerse themselves in his swirling and colorful flowers, cafes, and stunning landscapes. In Calgary, Canada, Tiffany Alisasis, we live in interesting times. Thank you, Tiffany. Meanwhile, the largest comics, sci-fi, horror, anime, and gaming event in North America kicks off. Ashley Sackmar is at the scene. Ashley. On October 22 to 24, Fan Expo has returned to Canada. Held at its usual location, the Metro Toronto Convention Center in the city of Toronto. The comic, sci-fi, fantasy, and cosplay-centered event, usually held annually, fell through in 2020 during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. As regulations ease up and the numbers drop within the country due to the increase in vaccinations, fans are now able
able to participate in the three-day Fan Expo Canada Limited Edition event. The annual event caters towards comic, sci-fi, and fantasy fans who, through the event, are given the opportunity to cosplay and dress up as characters from their favorite comics, TV series, and movies. The 2021 limited edition event focused on COVID-19 safety measures and regulations, ensuring the safety of all fans, celebrities, and staff. On top of mandatory vaccination requirements, all participants were reminded to bring their own hand sanitizer, practice physical distancing with an aim to keep at least one lightsaber apart from others, and replacing hugs and handshakes with elbow bumps, air high fives, and Vulcan salutes. Although the event looked different from previous years, Fan Expo Canada Limited Edition provided an opportunity for all fans to safely come together as a community. After a long two-year hiatus from this event, Canadian fans were able to once again see each other and share their love for comics, sci-fi, and fantasy. Oh, we and uh, <laughs> that's for tonight's broadcast, thank you so much for joining us. I am CJ Hero. We'll see you again on Monday. And at the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. We'll see you back Monday. I'm Alma Angeles and we live, we live in, in interesting times. times. Kami sa'yo po kami